My name is Meha Jain. I'm currently a postdoc at Stanford University and will be starting as an assistant professor at the University of Michigan this fall. And today I wanted to present some work that my colleagues and I are doing to try to understand the relative influence of canal versus groundwater irrigation for crop production in India. And the reason we care about this question is because groundwater is one of the main forms of irrigation for agriculture in India. About 40% of India's agriculture is irrigated by groundwater. But at the same time, groundwater reserves are becoming rapidly depleted across much of the country, with some studies estimating that wells, a large proportion of wells, may dry up over the next 20 to 30 years. So this paints a pretty bleak picture moving forward for India's future food security. So to give you an indication of what current groundwater tables are like, this is uh, a map showing basically overexploited areas in red. So these are regions where uh, withdrawal is greater than recharge. And you can see that a lot of this uh, red overexploited area is concentrated in the northwestern part of the country. And this is also where most of India's uh, staple food production actually takes place. So here in northwest India, okay, you can't see the pointer, but basically in the states of Punjab and Haryana, that's the heart of India's bread basket. It's where a majority of the rice and wheat is produced in the country. And it's also the region that's facing some of the greatest uh, levels of groundwater decline. So uh, this isn't kind of news. Uh, everyone really knows that this is happening from farmers to policymakers to government officials in India. And based on this, the government has started promoting alternate forms of irrigation to water crops. So these come in the form of surface irrigation sources like canals, reservoirs, and tanks. But when you speak with farmers on the ground, they'll say, you know, it's great to have an alternate source of irrigation that isn't groundwater, but canal irrigation just isn't reliable. It's really sensitive and dependent on the amount of rainfall that we get in a given year. So you can uh, you know, understand that. Basically, if it's a surface water body, it, you're going to have more irrigation during a heavy rainfall year, less in a lower rainfall year. And because of this, farmers still really want to rely on groundwater as much as possible. So what we wanted to do in this study was really try to understand how much do these different types of irrigation actually affect crop production right now in India's current uh, state. So do we really see differences both in the amount of crop production uh, from canal irrigated areas versus groundwater irrigated areas? And is, are crops more sensitive to weather variability in canal versus groundwater irrigated regions? And by understanding this now, we'll be able to kind of project moving forward to see, is this really going to be a big problem? Or how big of a problem is it going to be if groundwater tables continue to decline and become even a less, uh, uh, a smaller proportion of the irrigation that farmers use? So to do this, uh, we focused on the winter crop in India. And the reason we focused on the winter season is this is the largest agricultural season in India that isn't rain fed. So usually if you're seeing crops during this growing season, it's because they're being irrigated. Uh, most previous studies on agricultural production in India have relied on government census statistics. And these data sets are great because they have a very long time series from 1960s onwards. But the downside of these data sets is they're very coarse in spatial resolution. So here's a map just showing district boundaries across all of India. Um, there are about 600 different districts. And you can see that these are fairly coarse. And you could imagine that within a given district, you're going to have farmers using a variety of different irrigation sources, which makes it really difficult to draw any sort of statistical conclusion about what's the relative impact of canal versus groundwater irrigation on production, just because you can't directly link crop production with irrigation type. So what we did was we used satellite data to actually produce very high resolution maps of crop production across all of India. So this is just showing our final output and I'll walk you through how we produce these data sets. But basically we've created a product that is at a one by one kilometer resolution across all of India, mapping cropped area for the winter seasons from 2000 to 2015. Now this really high resolution data set actually allows us to directly match up villages that are using groundwater versus villages that are using canals. And now we can actually see, all right, what are the relative benefits of these different irrigation types? 
So just to give you a quick background, so satellite imagery has been available globally since the 1970s, and people have been using satellite imagery like Landsat and MODIS, two freely available data sets, to map agriculture for decades. But the methods that have been typically employed work really well in systems, agricultural systems like the US, where farm sizes are very large, and basically the size of a given pixel matches on really well with the size of a given field. This, however, isn't true in India, where most farmers are practicing smallholder agriculture, where one farm is usually two hectares or smaller. So what we did was we developed a novel method that actually maps uh, crop production for these smallholder systems. So I'll just quickly walk you through the different satellite products that we used. Um, one is called MODIS. I don't know if uh, you guys have used this in the past, but basically what this satellite gives us is at a 250 meter, meter resolution, it gives us a daily measure of vegetation biomass on the ground. And because we have these daily measures, we can really see a nice temporal phenology of agriculture. So if you look at this graph on the bottom left, you can see basically green up during both the monsoon and the summer season, indicating a crop was planted there, but then in the winter season, nothing was planted. The downside of using MODIS, however, is that once again, it's fairly coarse in resolution. So you can see that within one farm, or within one pixel, there are anywhere from 10 to 15 different farms, some of which are cropped, some of which are not cropped. So instead of seeing this nice high resolution um, image of farms, we just see one measure of greenness. So you can see we're probably going to over predict cropped area if we solely rely on MODIS. An alternate product is Landsat. This is available at a 30 meter resolution. And you can see this much better matches the size of a given smallholder field. The downside of Landsat, however, is you don't have this nice daily coverage like MODIS. Instead, you have an overpass frequency of every 16 days. And if there happens to be clouds on that given day, you basically end up with no data. So instead of this nice temporal phenology that you would see from MODIS, you might only have measures from Landsat three times during the year and not even during the times of peak crop growth. So this might not be an ideal measure either. So what we did, um, I'm not going to get into the details of this now, but I'd be happy to chat with you about this over the break. But we basically developed a method where we fuse the high spatial resolution of Landsat with the high temporal frequency of MODIS. And we were able to develop a product where instead of saying that this one 250 meter pixel is 100% cropped, we can actually say, oh, it's 20% cropped, or 50% cropped, or 70% cropped. And this much better allows us to map agriculture for smallholder fields. So once again, this is how we develop these uh, very high resolution, large spatial and temporal scale maps. And what we then did was we had access to this great village level data set produced by the Indian government, where for each village in India, we know the amount of irrigation that farmers have access to and the source of irrigation. So this is either coming from groundwater sources, like deep shallow or dug wells, or from canal sources, like surface or lift canals. And what we did was then we ran a suite of different regressions to try to tease apart what's the relative influence of these different irrigation types on crop production. So specifically, we looked at irrigation type. Um, we included a suite of different biophysical and demographic controls that we had from different census data sets. And then we also included different rainfall variables since rainfall can affect the amount of irrigation farmers have access to. To, to get at this question of sensitivity, we also interacted irrigation type with rainfall to see whether certain irrigation types did better or worse during high or low rainfall years. So this is just a parameter estimate graph showing the results of our regression. So this is something, this is an analysis that we did across all of India. And the way that you can read this graph is the dotted line represents the reference value for deep well irrigation. So these are groundwater tube wells that are typically 100 meters or lower. This is often the type of irrigation that a lot of farmers are relying on in India. And we compared the different sorts of irrigation, the two different types of canal, and the other two types of groundwater to see how does this compare to deep well irrigation. And basically, if it's to the left of the line, it has a negative parameter coefficient. And I highlighted significant uh, effects in red. So basically, all other types of irrigation are associated with less winter crop production than deep groundwater. 
When we look at this question of sensitivity to rainfall, this is where we're looking at the interaction term between irrigation type and rainfall. Once again, the dotted line represents uh, deep tube wells, which is our reference form of irrigation. And all other types of irrigation are more sensitive to both winter rainfall and monsoon rainfall. So in summary, basically these analyses are just showing us that at the All India scale, deep tube balls are associated both with greater crop production and also reduced sensitivity to, to rainfall variability, suggesting that alternate forms of irrigation are probably going to result in big shocks to production. So as I mentioned earlier, these analyses were done at the All India scale. India is a large country, it's very heterogeneous. You could imagine that you might see different effects in different regions across India. So what we then did was we ran the same regressions, but now at the state level to see whether there were any spatial differences in the relative importance of groundwater versus canal. And this graph, or this map is highlighting those results. So basically anything in blue are regions where groundwater outperformed canal irrigation. In purple are regions where canal and well irrigation had pretty much equivalent effects. And then red is the one state where canal irrigation actually outperformed groundwater. And the main take home message that I want you to see from this graph is if you overlay this map on that initial map that I showed you of groundwater exploita over exploitation, what you'll see is the states that have groundwater really outperforming canals, both in terms of increased crop production and reduced sensitivity to rainfall, those are the same areas where groundwater is becoming the most depleted. So this really is, you know, painting a bleak picture moving forward for what's going to happen to India's crop production over the next few decades. So in conclusion, uh, groundwater irrigation is associated both with increased crop production and reduced sensitivity to rainfall. And this is particularly true for regions that are the uh, you know, most susceptible to groundwater depletion or are currently the most overexploited. Over so what this really suggests in terms of policies is you know, switching over to canals, that's, that's one option, but it's really going to still lead to big shocks to India's production. Instead, what we also need to do is figure out ways to use what groundwater we have left more sustainably. So there are initiatives to do this. The government has pro been promoting uh, drip irrigation through heavy subsidies. Um, we might need to start thinking of ways to get farmers to switch to less water intensive crops. Just thinking of ways to reduce uh, the amount of groundwater irrigation that we use. Um, so some future work that my colleagues and I are doing is one is that we're trying to develop an even higher spatial resolution satellite product. So as of now, we're measuring cropped area at a one by one kilometer grid, but we're working on methods to actually bring this product down to a 30 meter resolution. So once again, we would then have crop production from 2000 onwards at 30 meters across all of India. The second project that we're working on is we're linking these different satellite estimates with this great groundwater data set that we have from 20,000 test wells across India. So Aditya Dar, he's also at this conference, he presented on some of this work yesterday. But basically what we're looking at is what are the impacts of actually falling groundwater tables on crop production across India. And then finally, cropped area is only one measure of this food security story. The other obvious one is yield. So I'm working with D David Lobel at Stanford. He's my postdoc advisor right now. And we're developing 30 meter resolution maps of crop yields. So, um, and then we eventually want to also link this with the irrigation and groundwater data as well. So just to show you what that looks like, uh, here's a map of wheat yields that we produced across all of northern India at 30 meter resolution. You can see once again that area of Punjab and Haryana in northwest India where it's mostly yellow and red. That's the area that's facing some of the highest rates of groundwater depletion. And that's also the area where we have the highest uh, agricultural yields for wheat right now. So we can see that this is probably going to have big shocks on production moving forward. Okay, thanks. Interesting sets of data, and you have very good analysis. I was just looking on your suggestion that you made about how then we can address this problem, that's a growing problem, and you mentioned about efficient irrigation or drip irrigation. And I'm trying to understand how that's going to help with the idea of depleting groundwater levels. By making more efficient irrigation, we may allow the farmers to expand their cultivation area and in northern India, we still have some land that we can irrigate more, right? 
So that would even accelerate the groundwater depletion if you go down the efficient irrigation pathway. Any comment? Yeah, that's a very good point, and that would be one concern, is basically if you allow farmers to use their irrigation more efficiently, they might extend their crop uh, cropped area. So some recent studies have been done that have looked at kind of farmer decision making and the factors influencing whether that area expansion would happen. And for the most part, it actually, from those very small scale studies, it doesn't really seem like the increase in area would offset the amount of water that you would save. But I think more studies need to be done on this at larger scales across multiple regions to figure out if this would be a problem. But even then, if you're thinking about this from a food security standpoint, yes, you might still have the same level of groundwater depletion, but you would at least have increased crop production, which would be an added benefit.